Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your kind welcome, and thank you, Sean, for your kind introduction, President Jerry Cohen and Mrs. Maureen Cohen. And thank you, everyone who's coming this morning. I appreciate the hospitality of the Allegheny Conference, the Pittsburgh Text Council, and the students and faculty of Carnegie Mellon University. We have a strong showing this morning from the Carnegie Mellon Naval ROTC unit as well, and I'm happy to be with all of you. This university has a fine reputation for its programs in business, finance, and other disciplines in the field of economics, six Nobel, Peace, Nobel Prize winners. And it's always worth recalling that economics is not a subject that can be wrenched apart from all the rest of life or from the values that give life direction. When we debate economic policy, we're talking about, after all, the deepest hopes that carry each of us along in the work we do and about all the things we wish for ourselves and for each other. And these can't simply be measured by simply running the numbers. In our free society, it's left to each one of us to make our own way in the world and our jobs, businesses, savings, pensions, farms, and homes are the work of years. Take these away, and you're diminishing a lot more than the GDP or the final tally on the big board on Wall Street. Take these away, and a million dreams are undone. The gains of hard work and sacrifice are lost. And something can be lost that is very crucial in our economy and very slow to return. Confidence. Confidence. Every so often in our nation's capital, we relearn this lesson when the excesses of traders and speculators and the poor planning of politicians catches up with them and the troubles spread far beyond Wall Street and Washington. This has happened in recent months at great cost to workers, small businesses, families, and homeowners across our nation. And calling these serious problems a correction in the market or a cycle of the economy doesn't make their situation any better, their jobs and homes any safer, or their lives any easier. As you all know, economic policy is not just some academic exercise. And we in Washington are not just passive spectators. We have a responsibility to act and if I'm elected president, I intend to act quickly and decisively. We need reforms that promote growth and opportunity. We need rules that assure fairness and punish wrongdoing in the market. We need tax policies that respect the wage earners and job creators who make this economy run and help them to succeed in what you all know is a global economy. In all of this, it will not be enough simply to dust off the economic policies of four, eight, or 28 years ago. We have our own work to do. We have our own challenges to meet. Millions of working men and women in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, and beyond can tell you how urgent is the work before us. One man put it to a, this way to a reporter not long ago in reply to a question about the job he had just lost. He said, I told my wife that I'll always keep a roof over her head. Now I worry about keeping that promise. In the monthly reports of our Labor Department, nearly 250,000 Americans like this man were let go recently and suddenly from jobs that they thought were safe. A woman in the town of Trainer in Delaware County also captured the feeling of many when she described what it's like to work and save for years and at the age of 47 still struggle for the basics of life. The family has had medical problems and as she puts it, trust me, no one wants to be in our shoes and lots of people are just a sick husband away from where we are. 
For citizens like these, doing their best to keep promises and meet obligations, there's no comfort in knowing their problems are common and their worries are shared. Meanwhile, the people we expect to be most sober and level-headed in their economic decisions, bankers and other home lenders, forgot some of the basic standards of their own profession. Hard-working homeowners are learning for the first time about the endlessly complicated borrowing, bundling, and betting that's been going on in our capital markets. Americans worry about a system. They worry about a system that allows 4 million bad loans to affect 51 million good ones. They wonder how assets can so quickly become liabilities and why the high-risk schemes of a few were permitted to inflict such grievous harms on our entire financial system. My friends, a little straight talk. Americans are also right to be offended when the extravagant salaries and severance deals of CEOs, in some cases, the very same CEOs who helped bring on these market troubles, bear no relation, no relation to the success of the company or the wishes of the stockholders. Something seriously wrong when the American people are left to bear the consequences of reckless corporate conduct. While Mr. Kane of Bear Stearns Mr. Mozilla of Countrywide, and others are packed off with another 40 or 50 million for the road. I leave it for others to speculate on the technical definition of a recession. It's all a little beside the point. If it's your plant that's closing and your job that's gone, and when you are facing foreclosure or back in debt after years of hard effort or hardly able to buy food, gas, or heating for your home. In the end, the truest measure of prosperity in America is the success and financial security of those who earn wages and meet payrolls in this country. Many are waiting for their first homes, their first big break, their first shot at financial security, and helping them will be my first priority in setting the economic policies of this nation. In so many ways, even now, the workers and entrepreneurs of America are taken for granted by their government, while the lobbyists and special pleaders are seldom turned away. By the tens of billions of dollars, our tax money is routinely squandered by the Congress on less than useless pork barrel projects, having nothing to do with the purposes of government and everything to do with the preservation of power. In the same way, many in Congress think Americans are undertaxed. They speak as if letting you keep your own earnings were an act of charity. And now they've decided you've had enough. By allowing many of the current low tax rates to expire, they would impose overnight the largest single tax increase since the Second World War. Among supporters of a tax increase are Senators Obama and Clinton. Both promised big change and a trillion dollars in new taxes over the next decade would certainly 